Did it work? <laughs> Sorry if you couldn't hear, hear, hear me, hear me in, in, in the past. I'll just go over this this slide again to, to account for those online. What's the atmospheric river? It's a it's a large narrow plume of moisture that goes from the tropics to the mid latitudes. We study them because most of the heavy precipitation events in the Northwest occur when they when they happen, and these heavy precipitation events can, can cause flooding, mudslides, and potentially river, even river overflows as well. When do the atmospheric rivers hit the Northwest? It usually happens in the winter months, often between October and March, but they can happen in the summer, and and that even though that is pretty rare. How do we define atmospheric river? Uh, atmospheric scientists use a metric called integrated water vapor transport, which tracks how much water vapor there is in a calm uh, of the atmosphere. This does not necessarily correspond to the actual precipitation that falls during one of those things. As for more important, as for more uh, uh, of the background information regarding atmospheric rivers, uh, does it matter where they hit? Yes, it does. If the atmospheric river hits too far south, then the coastal range in, 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 in Oregon and in Southwest Washington will block mo much of the moisture from getting to Seattle, and it will, ca and it will cause a rain, rain shadow effect. A similar, th a similar thing will happen if the atmospheric river goes too far north and hit and crosses over the Olympic Mountains. In a, so, in, in, in order for, for the general Seattle and King County area to get the most precipitation, the atmospheric river has to come through right through the Halos Gap in, 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 instead of over the mountains. And what's the difference between an atmospheric river and a pineapple express? If a pineapple express is, a, is strictly when an atmospheric river comes from Hawaii. Not every atmospheric river comes from Hawaii, although although most of them do, although they do come from the tropics. So every pineapple express is an atmospheric river, but not every atmospheric river is a pineapple express. This is important. This is an important distinction between the, between the two. That that that, that, that is a common misconception. Uh, as uh, why do we care about uh, why do we care about the temperature? Because that 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 will come to that will come to play later in this presentation too. The answer is that every given air parcel has a has a maximum amount of water vapor it can contain before condensation overwhelms evaporation, and this in this maximum is called the saturation mixing ratio. The Clausius Clapeyron equation is the thing that is the thing that, that links it to the temperature, and there's an exponential dependence. So increasing the temperature even a little bit can, can cause the saturation ratio to increase by a much greater amount. Why do we focus our analysis on atmospheric rivers? In the Pacific Northwest, cold ocean temperatures usually cause a stable atmosphere to exist, and mixing and atmospheric mixing seldom happens. As a result, most precipitation we get is stratiform, and which doesn't come close to the atmosphere's capacity for depleting water vapor. However, when an atmospheric river comes, its temperature is usual. It, 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 the, the temperature from from the air and, and water in it, being from the tropics, is usually is, is usually high enough to cause a much steeper temperature lapse rate. And as a result, you you end up with a more unstable atmosphere and convective precipitation, which is you, much more intense than our usual stratiform version. And if you want to hear more about convection, AJ, another person in this research group, will discuss that in in their presentation. Convective convection in their presentation later. This next slide shows what an atmospheric river actually looks like. They, as you can see, they bring moisture. They, they bring moisture both across the ocean and, and from the tropics to the mid latitudes. They can be they can be responsible for up to ninety percent of atmospherical myriad myriad um, moisture transport. And this and this next slide shows what can happen um, when an atmospheric river hit, hit, hits. Large amounts of precipitation can be dumped in only a short period of time, resulting in intense river. River flooding. What does that have to do with climate change? As the climate warms, sea level will rise globally. There will be more storms, including more atmospheric rivers. Precipitation will increase, and mountain temperatures will also increase. But many, much of much of this can cause flooding to occur more frequently. As as for what our, our climate models predict will ha happen, global climate models do not have a good enough grid, do not have high good enough grid spacing to pre to predict exactly exactly what will happen because convection is a very small scale phenomenon. We have to downscale these models, and this is done this is done with regional models such as the weather research and forecasting model, which happens to be run at, at, at the UWCL. This model has a much finer resolution required to 
diagnose these effects. And in addition, we have subgrids within that model that can, that, that, that can show that, that can show convection even, even more precisely without the need for parameterization equations. Now, what, what, what questions did we decide to investigate? Well, he, well, first of all, as climate change causes both atmospheric and surface temperatures to increase, what will happen to atmospheric rivers? Will, will they change the rainfall pattern? Will there be more of them? Will the amount of precipitation in each one increase? And all of these are important considerations to keep, keep, keep in mind when it comes to atmospheric rivers and climate change. So we determined the, the following hypothesis. If climate change increases the temperature of the atmosphere, the clausius clapeyron equation will show that the atmosphere saturation mixing ratio will also, will also increase. And knowing that atmospheric rivers can use up nearly all the water vapor in the atmosphere, they will be more intense because of the increase in this temperature. And here are some brief notes about the experiment we're going to do. We did. Uh, none of us can actually modify the real atmosphere, so we have to use these complex mathematical models that, that solve the atmospheric differ differential equations. It's impossible to perfectly know the state of the atmosphere due to, due to chaos theory, so there will always be errors in, in, in precisions. It's unavoidable. Uh, and these and these mathematical models can, can, can one can express different levels of climate change with them. For the analysis, we decided to use the most extreme level because while this isn't necessarily super likely, it does provide useful baseline for us to compare uh, uh, us to compare against. It's not it's not actually thankfully though it's not actually likely to happen. We will use a set of, for this analysis. We, we we use a set of, of twelve global climate models as well as one regional model to achieve the we. we through the required resolution. We call the, the global climate models are called GCMs and the region one is called the, the WARP, which means weather research and forecasting. How do we check the accuracy of the models? We, we do that by collecting actual observations and comparing both the model data to the observations. Part of the analysis will be based on observations and part of which are mo models will try to clearly delineate which, is, which, which are which. Obviously, if data are from the future, they're, they're from a model. None of the model results indicated whether they are from atmospheric rivers or not. So we had a first headed, so we had to define the threshold for, for them. To do this, we first plotted all the precipitation events and saw if there were any patterns. One of our models ran a simulation of daily precipitation between the years 1970 and 2099. These plots show the average and maximum daily precipitation by calendar day across all these years. We chose these variables to smooth out any natural, any natural atmospheric variability which could potentially hide climate change signals. The left plot shows the average precipitation by the calendar day, and the right sh sh shows the maximum one. The, what, the, what, the, what the visual display doesn't make clear is that the maximum ones are substantially or potentially way up to 10 times greater than, than the average ones. But you can, you can see there is a strong seasonality trend in the, in, in the average precipitation by day with lower amounts in the summer where we are now and higher amounts in, in, in the winter. But this seasonality trend is actually much weaker with the maximum precipitation. This, this reflects the fact that an atmospheric river is not necessarily a winter only thing. And, and, and the greater intensity is enough to offset the fact that they don't necessarily ha happen very often. And the next thing we decided to determine is how to delineate atmospheric river events. We can't look at them all. How do we, deter how, how do we determine what they are? Technical definition, uh, as I said earlier, uses water vapor transport, but that is quite hard to. That it, that is a quite complex calculation to, to, to do. So, so we decided to focus just on raw precip precipitation amounts. Anything above the precipitation threshold was defined as atmospheric river, while anything below it was not was not. We decided to use the 90th percentile so that only the top 10% of precipitation events measured by total rainfall were at, at, at atmospheric rivers. This will this this was the best delineation point given our analysis and the plots ahead will show show why. Now let's look at the daily precipitation trends on an annual base, basis. In general, the atmosphere's natural variability completely dwarfs climate, climate change. So we decided we go get a plot for every given year using the same model's data, the average daily precipitation for a day within that year. And we also decided to plot the maximum daily precipitation for a day within that year. And this would tell us if climate change was actually visible in, in, in the model. The left one shows the average precipitation for a day within a given year, and, and the right one shows the maximum, and they're both sort of, sort of chronolo chronologically. There just, you will notice that there doesn't seem to be that much of a trend between, between the two. Some, some years have higher values, some years have low, low, lower values. 
which which, which doesn't necessarily help our goalie because we don't necessarily know if there has been an effect due to climate change. But but we also figured out that maybe the only trend due to climate change is with atmospheric river events and not just with all groups of precipitation events. So we're so so we had to keep that that, that in mind as well. And to determine an appropriate threshold for atmospheric rivers, we decided to look at precipitation percentiles in any given year. How, how much precipitation in a given year was, was, was required to be the, the median, top 10th, top 5th, and even top 4th percentile? This would, this would tell us how, how much of an our atmospheric rivers could be. Now, if you look, if you look at, this, at, at this plot, not only does the median precipitation value barely move, while the top 10th percentile and, and, and above swing dramatically, one can see a very slow rise over the years at the highest end, which implies that the most extreme precipitation events, which does include atmospheric rivers, are indeed getting more extreme. So the atmospheric river threshold we set at a top 10 percentile. We also we also want to compare the precipitation with the, with the temperature, both for atmospheric rivers and non-atmospheric rivers, to see if there were any climate change influences on, on, on that. As, uh, looking at this chart, which which shows temp temperature versus precipitation amount for the top 50th and top 10 percentile, there doesn't seem to be that much of a correlation. In the, we are about the size that this is because the, the vast majority of precipitation events don't get near the atmosphere, the, uh, the atmosphere's capacity to hold water vapor, and thus wouldn't necessarily change too much with the temperature. But if we compare, if we looked only at, if we looked only the top fifth and top first percent percentiles, which did comprise all the atmospheric rivers, we saw there was a slight correlation between temperature and precipitation. And as and whereas as the temperature increases, so so is the precipitation value. This tells us that not only do atmospheric rivers become more intense, it tells us that atmospheric rivers can de can deplete most of the precipitation in, in, in the atmosphere. So we also wanted to see if there were any more atmospheric river events with climate change that, that, than before. So to, so, so to do this, we can we we compared one given model's results between uh, 1970, 1999 before climate change, and 2017, 2019 after climate change, and and and, 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 we, and we came up with this plot, which shows the percent difference in precipitation between those two types of events. You can see that atmospheric rivers seem to increase somewhat in precipitation between about 15 to 25 percent after climate change and before, while non-atmospheric river events generally generally stay quite flat. This is a this told us. That these climate change effects are primarily limited to atmospheric rivers due to, due to their intense uh, precipitation, and the, the, the model data was some little different. I see you're running short on time. Sorry. <laughs> these these next these next two plots show the atmosphere number of atmospheric rivers over time. You, you, you can see there's a slight up, upward correlation, but it's quite weak compared to the nat, 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 natural variability. Which, but it does show the atmospheric rivers increasing over time with, 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 with climate change. The only caveat here is the atmospheric river numbers every year are kind of unstable, and natural variability is pretty much dwarfing any climate change effect. But there was still a weak climate change effect from here. And finally, we decided to look at, at another university's data, which instead compared the which used the official definition of atmospheric river, rivers, and it, it, it showed something very interesting. There isn't much of a correlate. There isn't much of a change in, in the number of them oh, over time uh, so far, but there will be in the uh, but there will be in the future according to that university. Uh, and the, we we think this happened because we think this happened because the climate has only warmed up about one degree so far, whereas in reality it could warm up potentially up to eight degrees in in some of these simulations. Although in reality the climate change will probably be between three three and four degrees. And so, therefore, we, we figure out the, the effect is not noticeable because the temperature hasn't changed enough yet. As for conclusions, uh, we figured out that as temperature of the atmosphere increases with climate change, Claudius Clapeland equation predicts that the saturation fixing ratio also increases, which does indeed result in more atmospheric rivers and them having a greater intensity. But the effects of climate change are somewhat muted because atmospheric natural variability is greater than climate change and because products are just not warming as quickly as the mid latitudes. And atmospheric river, since atmospheric rivers get their moisture from the tropics, the, 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 the tropic temperature matters a lot more here. So, but if we keep warming your we have climate change, the number of the relative stability for atmospheric rivers will not be the case anymore. So, sorry for being a little bit over. <laughs> At this point, I would like to say thank you for viewing this. Anyone have any questions? Thank you very much.
time for one question. Any questions out there? I'm never gonna forget the pineapple express. <laughs> Send me by the way, I love it. <laughs> Any questions out there? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so your graph that was like specific to the temperature, you were saying how there wasn't like a clear linear trend, but it did kind of look like they were both bell curves centered around 10 degrees. Is there a reason for that? You know, so we're gonna repeat the question for the audience. So, okay. so, so the, the the question was if you if, if we go back to the precipitation versus that temperature temperature graphs, which are the which are these, you know, so that they, they kind of look like a bell 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 curve centered around ten degrees. This is most likely because the temperature plots as a whole, when compared to most other variables, are are going to be Gaussian. They're going to be bell bell shaped. Most of the stars are in the middle, and the the ten degree center is likely because the that is the approximate median temperature in the Seattle area, which is roughly, which roughly around like 12 C, which is probably what, what, what you're seeing. And it, it may it may skew if you look at if you look at the top 50, it, it, it may skew a little bit lower than that because because um, uh, of course most precipitation events occur in the winter, which is relatively cooler. So, any other question? Um, that was great. Thank you. So Thank you. Thank you. David, which one is yours? Atmosphere 21 is the one that's labeled with the 